Yes, we're going to hear. Great. Hello? Great. Welcome. Um, welcome to the GPC webinar. This afternoon, uh, the, the webinar is going to be looking at uh, a common approach to protection developed by the Red Crescent uh, and Red Cross within the Red Crescent and Red Cross movement. And to discuss this topic, we have the privilege this afternoon to have two um, senior panelists, Mr. Pierre Gentil, who is the head of the Tracing Agency and Protection Division at ICRC in Geneva. Mr. Pierre Gentil is responsible to establish the ICRC protection strategy and priorities at global level, specifically in the field of protection of civilians, POC, protection of people de deprived of their liberty and detention, restoring family links, an effort to clarify the fate of the missing, the transfer of people, and the provision of travel and other documents. Welcome. Our second panelist is Mr. Steph Stephen Weinwright. Uh, Stephen is the coordinator for social inclusion and protection uh, in the inclusion, protection, and engagement unit at, at the IFC. <coughs> And this unit is specifically responsible for developing the policy framework, operational tools, and guidance to ensure that all ICRC programs, IFRC programs, sorry, are as protective and inclusive as possible through a co comprehensive analysis of gender, disability, age, and other diversity-related factors. This unit also promotes effective use and volunteer engagement and development, including ensuring, and ensuring the safety and security of 12 million volunteers. So, is basically working with the, one of the biggest network of uh, development and humanitarian uh, entities in the world. I am Sophia Ketib Grundy. So, we can I ask um, our participants to put themselves on mute? We have a lot of uh, noise in the background. Hello? Can I ask all the participants to put themselves on mute, please? Yes, much better. Thank you very much. Just to introduce you myself briefly, I'm Sophia Ketib Grundy. I'm Senior Protection uh, Officer in the GPC in Geneva. I just joined a couple of months ago. And before that, I spent 10 years in the field with uh, the ICRC uh, and, and with the other organizations, including the UN. So welcome uh, to this uh, discussion this afternoon. In terms of uh, schedule and program, um, Mr. Pierre Gentil will start by giving us an overview on on the framework uh, from the IC per ICRC perspective, and then uh, we will have Stephen giving us the uh, IFRC perspective, and then we're going to have an, an open discussion with the with, with the Q&A. We have around an hour to do so, so we're going to have the first spend the first maybe half hour with presentation, followed by uh, hopefully a very interactive uh, discussion. So unless there is any pressing uh, issue, over to you, Pierre. And thank you very much for, for being with us this afternoon. But thank you. It's, it's a good opportunity indeed to present to other protection actors what we are discussing since now almost a year and a half, two years within the movement on uh, the need to foster uh, protection um, <clears throat> with all components of the movement. It's not new that the movement works on protection as such. So th this, is not, this is not something that we have to see as a um, sudden novelty. Um, the movement has a lot um, On certain domain, uh, there is a long lasting collaboration. <laughs> For example, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> For example, uh, on tracing, uh, we have the central tracing agencies that really kind of um, symbolize the collaboration of all components of the movement around one uh, thematic since decades, uh, coordinating all of the, um, the answer of the movement regarding tracing, ensuring that protocols and um, procedures are coherent and known to each other so as to facilitate collaboration between the different national society, cross-country, cross-continent. Uh, so on some thematic, it's, it's extremely structured. On others, it is more recent. If you take, for example, um, the work related to migrants in detention 
Um, since uh, some 10 years, uh, there has been regular meeting of national society and the ICOC and the Federation uh, on the topic to try to have common uh, principles to work together uh, around developing uh, procedures regarding that field. So, so there is some tradition at different uh, level of coordination on some thematics, but what we try now to achieve is to go beyond this sectoral approach, is to really have a reflection, global reflection on protection within the movement, trying really to promote uh, the principles, the standards within the, the movement, not to create a new one. Uh, the idea is really to, to take the existing standards um, and to see how they are applied today in the movement. Existing standards, um, the sphere, the do no harm from the Federation, the personal standards for protection work, a uh, more sectorial one on child protection and others, really the, the, the corpus that you know very well within the global protection cluster, so the, the, the standard that you are accustomed to, uh, and really make sure that they are today uh, widely understood and used within the movement, which is already to some extent the case. So once again, it's not totally new, but it's really a willingness to make sure that uh, this is a common basis, an understood common basis for all. It's also to kind of see what are the gaps today in the response of the movement to try to identify where we need to reinforce, to facilitate the complementarity between the component of the movement, uh, and to understand who has what type of skills, uh, know-how, uh, that could be useful to others when others want to develop program uh, on their own, uh, to who they should turn uh, to have advice, to have support. Uh, so having a bit of a sense of what are the centers of expertise that exist within the movement uh, and that everybody knows them. So it's not only that we know them at once in one office in the IFRC mm -hmm. and in ICRC, but that this is a knowledge easily accessible and that it creates a dynamic. Um, with that, the, the idea was, um, I don't know if we have the slides. Maybe we need to advance. Oops. We should have yep. slides Come arriving. Uh, we worked first to develop a common understanding on um, within the movement how we could conceptualize protection, starting from the YASC overall definition. So it was not about redefining the existing um, overall definition, but see how it, we can translate it for the movement. How can we really, from there, try to find um, language that is understandable by all components of the movement that makes sense for all national society. And we came with these three circles. A first one, a large one, that is really the one that is to be seen as compulsory for everyone, if you want. That is not a choice to opt in or opt out. This one is really a compulsory dimension. It's the dimension of do no harm, of protection mainstreaming. Uh, different wording, but I think here we, we all understand what we are talking about. It is part of the whole work of the protection cluster on mainstreaming. And the Federation, and probably you are going to say a bit more mm -hmm. about it later on, mm -hmm. had a whole work on Do No Harm, um, where there, uh, whatever activity the national IT is developing, uh, we wish really to make sure that uh, the one doing so have an understanding of the protection risk in the area they are working, that this understanding of the protection risk inform the program in a way to make sure that there is no negative consequences for the population and the beneficiaries. Um, mm -hmm. This is largely already the case. Uh, once again, this is not new, but it's just to really make sure that today uh, there is no exception into that, and this is really, uh, we all speak the same language. Then the, the second circle um, is around the, the um, protection programming, the specific actions that are really there to address the sources of abuse and uh, violation that uh, are addressing the risks, the threats that people are confronted with. Um, and here, uh, it can be of different nature, uh, as I mentioned, from detention, from tracing, child protection, there might be a lot of different types of uh, work being done. Um, and the third circle uh, that we identified in a lot of discussion within the movement, because many parts of the movement are implicated in it, is really this work to try to influence standards, normativity, um, <coughs> the framework being at national level, uh, being at regional, sub-regional level or at global level, uh, where many national societies, the Federation, the ICSC, have developed different strategies of influence um, towards this legal and normative framework, but also towards the procedures existing in a given country around different thematics. Um, 
So this really for us is a bit to, uh, to guide the discussions in the movement. As I mentioned, the first circle uh, is compulsory. Uh, the other two are somehow um, upon the choice of the nationality if they want or don't want to uh, have such type of program to do such advocacy work. So that's less of a compulsory matter. This is really, really about uh, choice, a willingness to do so. But once the choice is taken, once someone decides that, yes, indeed, we are going to develop a program on gender-based violence, for example, then at that moment, uh, indeed, the standards applying should be known, should be really uh, applied. And uh, within the movement, there should be a um, sense of who can we turn to to exchange, platform of uh, discussion, platform of exchange, uh, but also training modules. So with that, a whole uh, dimension is around the idea to have a committee of concern, a committee of practice uh, to be established. Um, we are precisely now starting to work on, um, I would say, the, the, the shell. Uh, we, we have developed uh, version zero uh, that is being tested as we speak. Uh, that should become live um, next year, early next year. Um, and at that moment, be open to all components of the movement. Uh, trying to find different national society, having different competency skills who would take a leading role in some of the thematics that have been identified. And this platform, there would be a general dimension to it about protection in general. In general. And then there would be a lot of uh, sub-chapters um, on the main activities that the movement is actually developing, where, of course, there we hope to see a lot of interaction between the different members of the movement. Um, so this will be launched early next year and presented at the next international conference of the movement, where states are also present, uh, by the end of next year. Um, beside that, there is a lot of training that are also being developed. Um, and here it's interesting because they are developed by national societies with the, the support um, that we give, but it's really being driven by some national societies. Um, and here, very quickly, we saw that there was a need to have training at different levels. You had, and you have the development today, uh, the Swedish Red Cross, for example, is developing a training for its volunteers and for its staff. Um, and here it's really about how to react. How do you react if you are a volunteer who uh, visits to home visit, for example, of elderly people or of different beneficiary, and you notice something wrong, and you notice that there is something that attracts your attention, what do you do? Um, so, so it's really about it, this notion of uh, identification and referral. Um, then you have the um, training that are more for the people who will be in charge of programming. Um, and here we have Norcross, the Norwegian, uh, who have developed um, a training where the idea is to bring people from different national societies putting in place program, exchanging on how they put in place this program with the standards as a baseline. So the whole idea is to take different chapters of the standards, the question of social protection work, and see how they apply to their program, um, what difficulty they encounter in uh, doing so. So, without going into too much detail, the whole idea is platform of exchange, where people should find documentation, good practices, have fora to exchange, face-to-face um, -face meetings also, training, so a lot of different dimension to try uh, in the coming years to really build up this existing competency, but really to have more of an interaction, more of a collective uh, intelligence around the, the work being carried out, and hopefully also um, in 10 years' time, really see a movement much more uh, present into protection matters. Um, with that, maybe let me just mention that um, whoops, one too much. There we go. Yeah. <laughs> Let me just mention that um, while we started this idea of having a um, committee of concern and practice, we also went to see the different national society and to ask them through a questionnaire, quite a complex questionnaire, where they stand today in protection. So what is the baseline today? Um, this questionnaire was jointly sent by the Federation and the ICOC to all national societies. Uh, what is interesting is that uh, we got 84 national societies who replied, uh, which is quite a high number. Uh, there is, like for many of you, I guess, tons of questionnaires floating around. So having um, 84 replies, it was not something you could do in 10 minutes uh, as a monkey survey if you want. It was really something you need to consult several 
several divisions within the national society, several people had to kind of join into the, into the answering of those questions. Uh, so to have 84 replied as such is already a first result. It does mean it's much more than what we thought. Uh, we, we did put the bar at 50. <laughs> we, we said we would go uh, and, and have kind of, uh, uh, <laughs> if need be, a record and record and record until we get 50. And in fact, we got 84 uh, without having to do really record. Mm. So that, that was yeah, a surprising first uh, result. Uh, the high level of responsibility uh, of national who feel that indeed, when asked about protection, uh, they have activities. And 89% of them um, say that they, they do conduct protection activities. When we look at exactly what they consider as protection activities, we see that the, the, the vast majority, and this is no surprise, is about the tracing activities, the, the family reunion, the, the whole family news network. Um, but we still have very high number for other dimensions. We knew there were many, but the, the numbers are probably a bit higher than what we thought. 70% for child protection, 61% for gender-based violence, 50% um, for healthcare in danger, so the whole protection of the medical services, detention, almost 50% also, human trafficking a third, conduct of hostility a third, weapon contamination a quarter, forensic activity a quarter, etc. So um, we were not surprised by mm -hmm. those categories, we were surprised by the number. I think the number are higher than what we had in mind when we launched the, the, um, the questionnaire. Uh, so this is the first result for us, is to see that the baseline today is already um, quite a big number of nationalities having developed programs in different domains. Some of them that traditionally we would have seen as the uh, domain of the ICRC, conduct of facility is typically one that the ICRC would traditionally say this is a domain we are in the movement, the one largely doing it. So it, it was, and it's positive uh, to see that uh, you have quite a high number of nationalities who are also today considering that this is something they should get involved and in, that they are already developing. Um, and that's why we really want to have now this uh, community of practice where discussions are taking place around it. We saw for detention where it exists that it was really needed, that a lot of questions uh, were there, that people were confronted to a lot of concrete questions when visiting, and that exchanging with other nationalities to confront with the same type of dilemma really helped uh, to create common principles, common standards, mm -hmm. um, and answer to concrete cases. So the dynamic is really something we are looking forward. It's not necessarily to have exactly everybody doing the same thing. Um, if this might be the case for tracing, because for tracing you do need to have procedures that are compatible country to country. The aim is to pass cases and case management through country and through continent. Hence, for case management, you need to have um, a certain unified way of working. This is not the case for other domains. For other domains, we can really imagine that under child protection, in reality, you have a lot of very different types of programming put in place. So the idea is not to unify that and have only one type of program. It may still be very different, mm -hmm. but at least to ensure that once they are, as I mentioned, in correspondence with existing standards, and secondly, that they benefit from this collective intelligence within the movement of trying to uh, exchange a little bit on the privacy. Well, I think with that, it gives you a bit of mm -hmm. a sense of um, the aim and where, where we are today. Um, so, so one and a half year of work to, to get there, to be ready to launch everything and early next year. And next year is really the year where it starts, where really we have this community of practice starting to take shape. Um, and hopefully by the end of next year, at the interest conference, we'll be able to showcase a little bit some of the results. Thank you very much, Pierre. Over to you, Stephen, to compliment on your perspective. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you, Pierre. Um, thank you, Sophia. Thanks for the invitation. It's a, a great opportunity to be here and discuss these things. And it's been a, indeed a great uh, journey. I think we've gone over together. It was uh, it, uh, the two organisations um, really was one of those times where we met at exactly the right point in the right space. That we were both really having similar reflections about the, I think, the growing involvement of national societies in protection area in protection work and we're and, and then because of that of course IFRC is the main you know coordinator and uh, um, uh, organization trying to support national societies in their capacity in whatever their priorities are um, was getting more involved in, in the protection work from that side um, it's uh, as you were saying Pierre sort of 
not new for the, for the movement at all, uh, protection work, it was, but maybe um, for the IFRC uh, and for some national societies talking about protective action but using the words and the terms and engaging in the protection discourse was a little bit new. So the, some national societies may be very familiar with that. Others may be doing a lot of child protection work, say, or doing working with survivors of uh, sexual and gender-based violence, but not um, maybe thinking of it in that, in that area and not maybe seeing the links with other types of protection work. Um, so the photo I have uh, here just to sort of start off the IFRC view is um, from Cox's Bazaar and uh, I chose that one just because it's quite maybe emblematic of um, uh, the operation, at least the recent operation that we, where IFRC as the, the coordinator of national societies uh, who went to Cox's Bazaar to, to support in that terrible situation were particularly uh, had a, a, a stronger focus than maybe any other recent operation on the protection issues there, partly because they were so obvious and so huge, um, but at the same time because we were, um, it was, a, I don't want to say a good opportunity, but it was the right moment for us to start to put into place a lot of the, the tools and guidance and, and uh, processes that we've been developing around protection issues, which um, i come back now to the sometimes affectionately call the egg <laughs> diagram uh, that, that captures the, uh, the different spheres or the different levels, different types of protection work. And uh, this works very well for, for us because of the breadth of action within the movement and particularly within national societies. So um, there's so many different ways that national societies do and choose to and are in, involved uh, with protecting people from uh, abuse and harm. So one sort of simplistic model of protection doesn't really work. It doesn't cover it uh, well enough, and, and this works for us. It covers it quite well. Um, looking at, because um, I think perhaps it may be that the ICRC's specific protection role is, is quite well known and very well established. The mandate is clear that the policy has been there for a long time for uh, IFRC. It's, um, it's more recent. So to just go through a little bit how, how we see the IFRC role in terms of its own uh, work and also supporting national societies, how it fits into these different spheres. The first is um, mainstreaming, minimum standards for mainstreaming. And this actually very influenced by the Global Protection Cluster's uh, own guidance on, on mainstreaming uh, because of the well-accepted um, role of, of that guidance and uh, the link with the ISC. Um, but very similar, as um, I'm sure that your people um, within the cluster know very well that, uh, gu um, that guidance and the, within mainstreaming and the focus on issues of dignity, access, participation, and safety, not phrased exactly the same way, but very much the same ideas, right? So I think we're, we're inheriting that collective understanding of what that protection mainstreaming is all about within the humanitarian world. And um, so our own guidance, now called the Minimum Standards for Protection, Gender, and Inclusion, is really about mainstreaming those three aspects, is focused on these, these uh, themes of dignity, access, participation, and safety. Very much in line with sphere as well, and really trying to just take collective knowledge of the humanitarian world and make it in relevant for Red Cross, Red Cross and societies. So, um, sort of tweaking it a little bit and, and putting it into Red Cross, Red Cross language. Another part of that, I mean, linked but slightly different, um, particularly around do no harm in the original sense of do no harm, that, um, where you're really looking at conflict sensitivity, right, and uh, the ways in which you might cause further harm, not just making sure that your programming is good and well designed, but also that it's not making things worse. We have a particular guidance around that, as Pierre was mentioning, better programming initiative is called, um, again, taking the standard sort of um, approach to what was called local capacities for peace right, in the 90s and making a guide around that. So, and as Pierre was saying, that's very much like mandatory for, or at least a, a mandatory, uh, I think every national society would wish and hope to, to be at least meeting these minimum standards in their operations. Uh, not that it's always easy, that would be uh, uh, an expectation. Just, just a second. Yeah. Excuse me, there's someone online that is unmuted. Could you please go back to mute, please? Thanks a lot. Sorry. Thank you. 
Just, just a second. We're just going to try to see who is. I think they're gone. Yep. Okay, thank Sorry you. Sorry about that. <laughs> <laughs> Moving to um, the specialized uh, protection activities, or standalone, uh, sometimes called, uh, if we get the animation coming here. No, maybe you can advance. Um, we saw that actually in, in the, the, um, the survey that uh, Pierre was just showing that um, there's, and indeed it was very much an endorsement of uh, what we understood national society's priorities to, to be in terms of uh, specific protection work. So uh, restoring family links was very, very high up there. Um, sexual gender-based violence were, um, prevention and support was very high. Child protection was very high. Um, the other areas that were also mentioned in the, that are the main areas where we've been developing guidance and training and, and tools for national societies, as you hopefully see on the screen there, around trafficking in human beings, uh, legal advice, particularly in migration, but in, in other contexts as well. Um, then access to education and, and the safety and security of volunteers are two aspects which we see is very much sort of underlying in their specialized action and they're very supportive of protection work. Slightly different, of course, than directly supporting uh, survivors of uh, violence and abuse, but uh, in, a, in a preventative uh, mechanism that um, is very important for a lot of national societies. As many people probably know, we have 12 million volunteers around the world and uh, to ensure that their understanding and their own safety and security is taken care of is, is really a key element in uh, allowing national societies or enabling national societies to, to perform the protective action. Um, then coming to the influencing uh, aspect, uh, it, indeed it, it's a, a common um, aim of the different movement components in, in, I would say, quite different ways. I mean, the access of ICRC is uh, specific, well understood, and, uh, and quite unique, and, and of course that influence is used in, in many useful ways. National societies as auxiliaries to the humanitarian action of their governments have another particular role to play. Uh, as a federation, we try to really uh, take that uh, auxiliary role uh, and um, support it and also bring that to the, the regional and global level and uh, bring common issues, common protection issues and other issues, but bring those to the attention of um, international forums and so on, representing uh, our membership. Um, so there's these three different ways in which um, national societies are, are active in different ways, and as Pierre mentioned, very much a choice. It's not about um, uh, IFRC or ICRC, for, for that matter, being directive about what should uh, be done, but about rather supporting that collective wish and collective interest. And we see around child protection, around STBV, a lot of collective interest, a lot of collective action. And indeed, a lot of collective, really excellent practice that we are now looking to really capitalize on and, and benefit from in that community of practice. That's the overview. Uh, I have a few more minutes, so maybe just yep. go into a little bit of um, kind of go back to the beginning and go into some of the, the aspects for each of those. Um, as I mentioned, uh, we, we call our protection mainstreaming guide, uh, which is basically what it is, uh, the minimum standards for protection, gender, and inclusion. And uh, this concept of protection, gender, and inclusion is one of the seven areas of focus of the IFRC uh, in the strategic plan. It has a very broad um, uh, reach in many ways. When we look at that broad reach of considering protection, gender, and inclusion issues in emergency response, that's when we uh, look at the dignity, access, participation, and, and safety. And uh, there's a particular focus in the emergency response <coughs> where, I mean, in that guidance, there's a very practical kind of list of recommendations by sector of what um, sectoral delegates should be doing. The um, easy and often quoted example is locks on toilets, um, lighting on the pathways in the, in, in the camp situation, um, and many other very practical guides uh, making sure that um, basically all of the different needs are analyzed well, the different needs of men, women, boys and girls, people of different uh, ethnic groups, people with different uh, abilities, and then addressing those accordingly. 
<clears throat> and by doing that, uh, ensuring that dignity, access, participation, and safety. Um, so we're boosting that in terms of expert, uh, meaning people who are uh, protection experts, people working with PSS background, sex social support background, uh, with a child protection background, with a background in supporting survivors of violence, and uh, bringing that expertise and knowledge to the field. But also um, bringing into the job descriptions, into the terms of reference, into really the you know, the nuts and bolts of each emergency operation, making sure that everyone who's involved has a basic level of understanding of different needs, different uh, requirements, and how to address those. So that's what our mainstreaming guide is about. Um, looking at, um, I think I went one too quickly, yep. Going back to specialized, I mean, as I mentioned already, but just to uh, sort of, uh, to worth repeating uh, those main areas where national societies are working when we're supporting them. Um, we'd talk to briefly about how then a national societies, how is IFRC engaging in cluster mechanisms, right, uh, at, at the country level. And uh, Cox's Bazaar certainly was uh, one example where we were very engaged, uh, with IFRC particularly uh, in, engaged in those meetings, in the, um, in the, the cluster meetings themselves, in the relevant task forces and sub-working groups that were established um, and supporting the Bangladesh Crescent also to be participating in in those meetings. Um, in some cases, the National Society, as I was mentioning earlier, is maybe very active in terms of um, doing very good work, but not so familiar with some of the mechanisms, the international mechanisms, maybe not so familiar with the language, the working culture of cluster mechanisms. So I think there's a, a facilitation role where we're helping to translate that good practice at national society level into uh, into those kind of international mechanisms. But certainly um, my colleagues working more you know, precisely are coordinated for child protections, are coordinated for uh, gender-based violence, uh, see national societies and uh, IFRC delegates um, participating more and more frequently in uh, cluster mechanisms protection-related cluster meetings at a country level. Hence, indeed, the, the need for this whole process, actually, to, to make sure that when we are engaging that um, and national societies are choosing to be involved, that we're doing our best job to make sure that um, we're really benefiting from the collective knowledge of the 190 national societies around the world and, and uh, the movement at large, um, and very much benefiting from the uh, very detailed guidance in the uh, professional standards for protection work um, produced by ICRC. So, you know, making sure that that knowledge is easily available and, and usable. Coming lastly to um, what we call in the egg uh, influencing standards, norms, and, and law. And uh, also through that, I think influencing behavior, um, you know, at the community level, actually. Uh, and. Uh, Here's maybe one of the particular areas where um, it's not there on the slides, but the, the fairly unique role really of uh, or aspect of national societies is that they are completely local national organization, right? And they are, have always been present before, well before, during and after crisis events, um, uh, are embedded within the community, the, uh, in the best cases, the uh, Volunteers are very much community members themselves, um, but with the links to their government, as I mentioned earlier, and links to the international humanitarian uh, system through through the international components of the movement. So there's ways there that we're they're really able to um, have that local understanding and have that um, contextual knowledge that allows for the protection work to be very well informed by that from the bottom up and from the top down as well, actually, and I think that's particularly important here in terms of the influencing standards, norms, and laws. So there's uh, uh, one aspect that we talk a, a lot about, and it's also uh, in the Global Protection uh, Cluster's mainstreaming guide, where we're talking about environment uh, building or, or the enabling environment or different ways to talk about, well, every possible action and every possible element that you could think of, really, that is supportive of a protective environment, right? So both the legal aspects, uh, but also the cultural aspects, and um, it, it's very broad. 
Yeah, there's, yeah, as I say, I mean, a particular role for national societies to play, I think, because of this um, special uh, sort of unique uh, status, which, uh, which you don't really find elsewhere. Not to boast, <laughs> but just, you know, recognizing that there's, there's a, a potential there. Uh, so within that, um, it, uh, the, the protection work then extends not just into humanitarian action per se, right, in terms of the crisis uh, moment and in terms of the uh, when uh, the, the risk of violence is particularly high, but it's also really that ability to um, support an enabling environment before and after uh, such uh, con conflicts, uh, war and other particularly uh, moments which are prone to violence. So that that's also gives a um, one of the, the ways in which the, the understanding or the scope of protection within the movement as a whole is necessarily broad. Um, as I say, similarly broad, we, if we look at uh, ISC's policy, uh, it uh, also has that very broad view of, uh, uh, around uh, an enabling environment that allows specific and precise action as much as possible. We have somebody... Yeah, uh, thanks, Elizabeth. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but that brings me to the end of the things I wanted to share anyway. Um, I'll just wait for that to be... Yes, good. let's just try to resolve yeah. that uh, noise in the background. Thanks. Thanks. Th thanks a lot, Stephen. Yeah, uh, just, you so just conclude. to con conclude, I mean, yeah, it's... um. I think we've together given a view of the, the, the breadth of the, of the movement work in, in protective action. Um, there's a huge scope there for engagement with, with external actors, of course, and that's already happening very much. I mean, in many ways, I think from national societies, ICRC, IFRC, of course, uh, in many ways that we're engaging. Uh, and that's, I think, why we were interested and very happy to be here to, to share some of those thoughts because there's a lot more that we could do together in terms of having common understanding, common work, and uh, um, looking forward to questions, comments, and um, any clarifications. Yeah. Great, great. Th thanks a lot, Stephen. And great, great to hear that uh, that there is an effort now to to strengthen the standard, the coherence, uh, professionalize the work of uh, protection of the national societies. And definitely a great opportunity for for um, for the cluster to to seek uh, more uh, interaction with the national national societies on the ground and the IFRC when uh, when you're present. Uh, so it's, it's a great opportunity for for for, for interaction. I, I'd be really interested to hear your your question uh, from from the field. Um, so if you have question, please unmute yourself and uh, state your your name and maybe the country where you're based. And maybe just to kickstart uh, the discussion, if you allow me, I'm just going to ask you one, one question. Um, we've seen a general trend to have increasingly autonomous and strength, strength, strong role of national societies. So with their more explicit role in protection now, wh what are the risks that you, you perceive, knowing also the close relationship that we have uh, between national societies and the government, mm. um, and, and what are the mitigation measures that you are taking just to ensure that the minimum standards are always uh, uh, respected, even when the government is part to the party to the con conflict and sometimes also mm. uh, uh, exerting uh, coercion against its own population. Mm. Go ahead. I must say that there, what we see today is that... <laughs> Sorry. Excuse me, colleagues on the, in the field. Hello? Hello. Hello, could you please put yourself on mute? Thank you very much. Okay, okay, no, no problem, yes. Thank you. Just press the little mic sign. Colleagues in the field, there's someone who is not muted. Thank you. Much better, thanks. So <laughs> basically, today you have a variety of national societies and a variety of different realities. 
Um, for the large, large majority, I honestly don't think that today there is an issue with uh, the fact that indeed they have this role of auxiliary to the authority, but it's a role where usually an authority find a space to uh, have a dialogue with the authority. And that's why the importance of the third circle is there, mm. is that what we see today is that nationality are also, and it's, it's more an opportunity than a risk in most cases, it's an opportunity because they do have this capacity to actually bring uh, their views and try to influence policy and also uh, influence um, the, their own government on some of the issues that they are concerned with. Um, I think today what we, we mostly see is national society who try to find this equilibrium between being an auxiliary to the authority on responding to some crisis and uh, bringing up a voice uh, towards authority and advocacy uh, to have changes in the, the frame when they see that this is necessary. And it's of course an equilibrium, but uh, we, we see mostly today national society who are uh, taking that seriously and I think there, uh, the fact to exchange around it, to try to see um, what has worked or not, uh, to have this committee of practice to, to, to bring those, those examples forward will only help. Mm -hmm. and you may have cases where it's more difficult and some are still choosing not to work on some areas. And that's why also there is this notion of choice. It's not that we expect every national society to work on everything. Possibly in some cases, uh, it's perfectly understandable that they won't. They won't work on some thematics. Um, so this is today uh, the variety of the realities in the field to which nationality are confronted and the option they take um, is there, is to be recognized. So it's not about having a one way of working and expecting the same thing from everyone. Um, what it is about is really to make sure that when people take the option to enter into a protection dialogue, they do so in a way that is really compatible to the standard. That when really this decision is being made, to say, okay, there we, we think we can influence our authorities or other stakeholders. Uh, we think we can put a program in place um, and we have the capacity, and they, they have really incredible capacity very often, um, that then it is done in a way which is professional, it is done in a way which does take into account the extremes of others. But we will we'll still end up at the end of the day, even if in 10 years we are successful with having been able to, to brought that up in terms of uh, more exchanges, more personalization, a better understanding and appliance of the standards, you'll still have a patchwork of national IT doing different things. And this, I think, is something we not only are conscious of, but it's even probably that, um, better like that, that people do well what they think they can do, rather than having the feeling that they need to do everything, mm. uh, and in the end not doing it well for a variety of reasons. Yeah, I mean, it, it, it's uh, probably, I mean, I know at the, at the Global Protection Cluster Conference uh, last year, that, that related issue was, was one of the thorniest ones, right, one of the most difficult ones to, uh, uh, I mean, in, in term, not in terms of national societies, but what to do when, when the government is complicit or suspected, let's say, to be complicit. I think uh, I would also say, I mean, there's, the, the risk is quite really limited for national societies. Societies, the, if there is a risk, it's more when they're maybe not as active as they could be, rather than uh, being active in a in an unhelpful way. Also, I, mm -hmm. think, I mean, there there are this is a variety of national societies, a variety of ways in which the, that relationship with the government is is balanced, and we have guidance on how to make that uh, relationship a balanced one. In, indeed, um, I think um, maybe that what we are trying to really developed there with this community of practice and related mechanisms is where there's a national society who sees protection risks that they would like to really be involved in minimizing um, but don't yet have a, a lot of experience in doing that then they can call on their sister national societies and the components of the movement for further guidance on how to do that um, and, uh, and and indeed that some of that guidance might be um, that there's a better placed uh, organization within the, the country to to work on, say, child protection, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Quite a lot of the guidance uh, in the minimum standards on uh, protection, gender inclusion are around referral, and we have a, I mean, a, a big part of our work is as you have these, you know, community volunteers on the ground seeing 
issues, seeing protection issues from Stockholm to Cox's Bazaar to uh, Kinshasa, uh, having a huge range of possibilities to actually deal with that issue directly. But I think all of them, you know, at the minimum will be able to recognize the signs of, of, uh, of actual violence or risk of violence or risk of abuse and then know what to do about it, know who they could go to, know who they could refer the case to. Right. Uh, so, and then it, those national societies who then choose to really build up that capacity and hire specialists and hire psychologists, child protection experts, you know, can then start to, in those cases, really address the cases directly, uh, and that's the choice that they make. So, I think the biggest risk is, is uh, more us, us not capitalizing on and collecting and using the benefit of that movement experience. Uh, and that's, that's the purpose of the project in a way. Yeah. Maybe if, if I may just mm. add one thing, in some context and conflict situation, there is still clearly a role that is very specific for the ICRC. Mm -hmm. uh, so this endeavor to try to, to bring the movement more in phase with protection today is not about trying to suggest that in conflict areas the ICRC will kind of go mm -hmm. out of its, of its role. Mm -hmm. uh, so if you take detention, uh, we clearly see that National Society today are engaging a lot when it relates to migration, migration detention. Um, but security detainee in conflict is still clearly the ICRC. Um, and there I would, I would suggest that this makes sense, because there precisely not only do we have the experience internationally of having worked on this type of detention since decades, but also, yes, the relation with the government is different to discuss those type of, uh, of situations. Mm -hmm. So I think there, um, very clearly, there is also uh, a clear understanding within the movement in some cases that some protection domains in conflict will still be uh, clearly um, linked to the ICRC, while others will be linked to national society. What maybe has changed is that even if it was not de facto always the case, but there was a bit in the rhetoric a sense that when it was conflict, protection was necessarily the ICRC. At one stage, it was a bit in, in the rhetoric, mm. whereas national society were more. Um, potentially developing protection work out of conflict area. I think today there is a recognition that even in conflict, you may have some activities that national society can do in terms of protection that make a lot of sense, what they can really bring a difference, um, and where this is not about a competition between the members of the movement. Mm. Whereas there are some activities, like once more detention to safety detainee, which will remain uh, the work of the ICRC because of its unique statutes and because of the agreement it can pass and the protection it can give to its own staff uh, when working on those type of issues. Mm -hmm. So that there is, I would say, there mm -hmm. to also clarify a bit this notion um, and we'll have to go to be a bit more subtly into um, what is it that we expect or not from the ICRC and national IT in conflict environments. Thanks a lot. I'm conscious of time. We have around 12 minutes, 10 minutes left. Uh, I'd be very interested to have comments and questions from the field, so please go ahead and introduce yourself uh, when you ask the question. Hello. Hello. Uh, hello, good evening. Uh, I am Zahra Haq from Pakistan. Uh, I have a question. Uh, thanks a lot. Uh, it's really a fruitful session. It's really informative. I have a, uh, one question around uh, minimum standards. Has IFRC its own minimum standard on gender protection inclusion or has adapted from interagency standard committee minimum standard? Uh, another question is can you further elaborate about inclusion minimum standards? Uh, 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 what my understanding about inclusion mainstreaming uh, uh, to include the excluded group like as minorities, person with special need, or person with disability, or transgender uh, minorities. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Do you mind just rephrasing and please keep your, your uh, question short because the line is not very good. Do you mind just rephrasing the first one? We didn't get that. Thank you. Uh, my first question is. Uh, uh, has IFRC its own minimum standards on uh, protection, inclusion, and gender? Or uh, has they adopted from interagency standard committing minimum standards? Yeah. 
Okay, uh, yeah, I mean, the short answer is uh, yes, uh, we do. Uh, we, uh, in fact, the, um, the second edition of, of uh, that guide, so Minimum Standards on Protection, Gender and Inclusion, was uh, arrived in our offices today, so it's uh, an exciting day. Uh, and it um, uh, is uh, very much in line, as I was mentioning, uh, with uh, the Global Protection Cluster's mainstreaming guide, and I would say very much sort of inspired by a sphere. Uh, and also um, uh, the uh, internally displaced uh, persons, I can't remember the exact title now, but the guidance on protection for IDPs. Uh, so it's, uh, it's not, it is its own one, uh, and the reason for that is because of the particular ways that national societies and IFRC work, so it's adapting the same ideas, let's say the same principles around dignity, access, participation and safety for a Red Cross Red Crescent environment. Uh, and uh, I think your second question was about whether or not it considered issues of inclusion of minorities, people with disabilities, transgender, and so on. Uh, absolutely, uh, very much so. It, it's quite, it's a very central uh, aspect of the, of the guide. Um, it was actually previously called the Minimum Standards for Gender and Diversity in um, Emergency Response. We changed the title to make it clear and emphasize a bit more the protection aspect. Uh, but our, our protection, gender, and inclusion way of working is very much based on looking at the needs of those excluded and marginalized people and seeing how to best address their needs, knowing that they're very often at the highest risk of, uh, of uh, protection um, concerns. Thanks a lot. Another question from the field? Anyone? Maybe. Yes, we can hear you. Yeah, <clears throat> actually, we, we are in Yemen. Uh, these days, you know, uh, about the war, we uh, work in uh, organizations that <clears throat> care about uh, protection, um, childhood, and, uh, uh, you know, uh, <clears throat> uh, for what? For refugees from, uh, from, from different countries. Uh, from different cities in, in Yemen. We need to know the, the latest standards uh, about the norms and law. Sorry, are you referring to norms for the movement or in general? Yeah, uh, in general, because uh, we have uh, three activities. Okay, that goes a little bit beyond uh, the scope of the discussion today, I think. Uh, but we can take this offline and, and maybe so send some, some, some information to you bilaterally. Do you have any specific question related to the presentation and the movement itself? Okay, uh, we need to know about the gender. I can try to um, I mean, link the, the two questions. Um, very clearly, when we discuss within the movement about how do we operationalize this overall definition of protection that the YASC has agreed upon, which basically um, is an agreement between very different types of organization having different types of activity, hence that is very generic, which is about ensuring that uh, dignity but rights of people are also being respected and refers then to um, the existing legal framework. Um, and here, what we clearly reaffirm is that indeed all the protection activity that we have is not about pretending that we are responsible for protection. It is the authorities and in some cases armed groups who have this responsibility. So the responsibility um, lies clearly with the authority and armed groups to uh, protect and uh, respect international norms. What we can do is to try to bring measures that either are linked towards the work, towards the authority to precisely have them taking more seriously this, uh, this responsibility, pointing to areas where this is not the case, um, supporting sometimes some measures they can take, or on the other hand, working with communities, individuals, to try to see what can be done to diminish the exposure to risk, to diminish the, the, um, the threats, that they are encountering. So you have these two, these two dimensions from the community or the, the people at risk perspective, diminishing exposure to risk, 
increasing resilience and diminishing vulnerability. Um, and you have the perspective from a more state-centric approach uh, around the, the notion of um, ensuring respect for the existing legal framework. The existing legal framework, this of course, is not a framework where as such we can reinvent it uh, as we see fit. Uh, this, this legal framework is the one adopted by states. The best we can try to do is from experience in real life, try to then influence global discussion. We now have very uh, soon from us in a, few, in a few days, the signing of the um, uh, refugee and migrant um, compact. agreement compact, and which are the result of a, of a long lasting process where both the IFSC and the ICOC and many others, many national and many actors, have tried to influence to ensure that protection mm -hmm. dimension is being input into those texts. So that, mm -hmm. that's the way we can influence this kind of uh, overall mm -hmm. uh, text. Um, and successfully so. And successfully so in, the, in, that, in that dimension. Now the standards uh, are much more linked, and that's the one we are really now trying to, to uh, put the weight into this initiative, are really linked to somehow the, the whole lessons learned that we have collectively as humanitarian human rights organization been um, developing through our own experience. So having had decades of work, um, being in certain domains, child protection, gender-based violence, or being globally on protection, um, from this experience, we, we, take, we take those standards for us on the do's and don'ts in our work. So they're, of course, not normative, and they are not redefining the, the, the applicable framework, mm -hmm. but they are about how we should run our operation um, to increase the, the chance of uh, success. So I, I hope that this kind of answer a little bit to, to your global question, but also linked to what we try to do within the movement, was really this logic of pushing the standards um, as a basis of work to, to be used when designing action, but also on this last part of the egg that we mentioned, and this third circle, influencing, making sure that components of the movement don't shy away from having a dialogue mm. at national level from with their authority on responsibility, responsibilizing, sorry, the authority on their obligation, uh, and that this hopefully they, they do. It can be done discreetly, it can mm. be done half discreetly, it can mm. be done publicly. So the different national states in different circumstances may choose different ways, but uh, important is that they try to have this dialogue, uh, and um, when there are discussion around new normativity, that we bring the, the wealth of knowledge from the field to influence those, those texts. And that's exactly what mm -hmm. happened, I think, with the compact. Yeah. It was about bringing the, the, the wealth of knowledge of what are concretely the problems that people encounter, what are concretely the case that we see, uh, the type of protection issues you would like to see in those texts, based on the experience of uh, all of those national societies. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I just add, I mean, it is a great example that uh, shows how this inner circle of kind of influencing uh, can kind of trickle down uh, right at the, you know, working with local authorities to really having a very specific discussion about, say, a, a referral procedure to the national authorities within one country and then indeed bringing all that up uh, to, to the global level. So I think that's uh, one of the great delights of working within the movement is to be able to see uh, how to aggregate that, that kind of concerns and, and, and to have that, that kind of influence. Thanks. We are almost close to the end. Uh, I'd like to invite one more um, question from the field. Nope. If someone wants to speak, please uh, speak yes. now. Uh, yes, sir. Uh, we can hear you. Yeah, this. Go ahead. Someone still has their mic on. Is there anyone else who wants to ask a question from the field? Thank you so much. Welcome. Hello. 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 Yes, yeah, there are yes. two things. One, uh, I want to make a compliment on what uh, Pierre was saying. Um, protection is, uh, you know, many people don't think uh, that is all about uh, everyone, collection. I mean, collective efforts, uh, whereby we need to recognize the local law and the national law, and then the international law. That it should be implemented uh, yeah, like all of us, and each and everyone responsibility. It is not like uh, probably how the other people think it's probably a mandate for 
ICRC or a mandate for, you know, for uh, for the UN, for a mandate for a UNSCR or a mandate for a particular organization. It's a collective uh, effort. And that also uh, answer part of the question that I, I, I put forward is that how do we mainstream um, protection, particularly child protection and GBV in the local context uh, to make it practical? Thanks. So. Where are you calling from? Uh, from Juba. Juba. Uh, hello, Juba. Yeah. <laughs> Over to you. Yeah, thank you. Was how to mainstream? Yes, how to kind of maximize the work of local actors and to mainstream uh, protection, particularly child protection, GBV, uh, at the local level. Right. I mean, I think from our perspective, I kind of mentioned the key ways that we uh, do that. I mean, it's very much about making sure the analysis is right and that the analysis is informed by uh, issues of gender, diversity of all, of all types. <coughs> and age in particular, language, uh, ethnicity, and so on, and uh, doing that in an informed way by people who are uh, used to the right, let's say, the, the best way, most appropriate way to identify risks, and, and then uh, having done the analysis, then look at the um, best practices to apply, right? And knowing that protection risks, perhaps in particular, are very, very contextualized, very local, and so from the national society perspective, it's maybe that, that's the uh, the advantage that they bring, um, uh, and then bringing, which basically is what we've put into our, our minimum standards guide, um, the collective experience of national societies around the world of how to then act on those risks once you've identified them. So it's about the contextual analysis and then the appropriate action, uh, and I think that's a common message in as the other uh, participant mentioned, there's a number of mainstreaming guides. There's a reason for that, you know, different organizations need their own take, but there's a lot of common um, points, and, uh, and I think it's those two, uh, about the context and the, and the appropriate action. I may add something, I think, that there is two dimensions that we try to promote. One is to make sure that you have a dialogue with people working on protection in a regular basis. So as to have an understanding of what are the trends that are really existing, the, the ones that are uh, evergreen, the ones that mm -hmm. are coming up, the ones that are disappearing, but that you have an updated sense of what are the threats in the area you work. And if yourself as an organization, you don't have uh, that capacity to have this analysis, uh, to have discussion with people who have it, so as to, to, to be able to make informed decisions. The other part is, it can not only be about uh, listening what other organizations are seeing, analyzing, it's also about, of course, hearing what people themselves, beneficiaries, are, are saying. So to make sure that um, you kind of have these two dimensions. One is what people working on protection and working on trends see as trends, but the other one is from the community perspective, having their sense of uh, the risk they are confronted to. And when you organize whatever activity, try to really have a sense of how do they feel about it, how do they feel about uh, that, um, the way it is being done. If, if by distributing some assistance in a given place, you actually um, inadvertently provoke a risk mm -hmm. for them uh, in singling, singling them out as beneficiary in a way that they then might face pressure, that you have the capacity to have this feedback, this understanding. So, and this is just very often spending time with people uh, to hear about their concern and hear about the risk that they, they see um, and be open to, to, to address them. My experience personally is really that if you have short time with community and people, people know us very well. So they know exactly what to say usually to get the maximum out of the program we can have because they know our program, they know. So, so if you just have half an hour, basically people will and it's normal um, address you to try to, to make sure that you understand their needs from the perspective of what they think you can bring. Um, if you spend much more time, they start to speak about a lot of other things, about things that are not related to what they think you are able to bring. And that's where you start to hear about a lot of their concern. Um, and that's where suddenly you pick up things that uh, you say, oh, but this uh, maybe it's not related to my program indeed. But the fact that I know it exists Maybe I should do my program slightly differently. Um, so it's time, it's really time with people, time with community, listening to them, listening to them to speak about things that are not directly linked to what mm -hmm. you are doing. Mm -hmm. um, 
it looks simplistic. The big issue there is time. And today, I don't know for you, but I see for my colleagues, time is something we don't have. Time is something that we, we cut short mm. for a lot of reasons, bad reasons, good reasons, security, administrative tasks, data visits, can make a long list of reasons, but the time we spend with people on the ground listening to them, despite everything we say, um, is not enough. Mm. Uh, and I think there, if we have to be serious about really mainstream protection, we need to spend time with people to, to once more hear all of their concerns that sometimes are not related directly to what we do. Um, and this takes time for people to, to tell. And you then relate that with what people working on protection from UNHCR, from ICS, from other organizations, tell you about trends. Um, and I think if you have the two, then you are in a good position to make informed choice on how to have programs that are uh, <coughs> not bringing any more harm. Thanks a lot. A very interesting discussion. Unfortunately, we're reaching the end of uh, our webinar. I just want to conclude on, on, with two key conclusions. I mean, the, the great kind of welcoming news that, you know, national societies who have already been doing a lot of protection work will be uh, more and more increasingly doing so in a more structured way. And as you said, so uh, a very strong and important local actor present throughout the year before after crisis. So very, very important soundboard for us to engage with. Um, so I, I invite and I hope we will uh, have increasingly uh, kind of more, more engagement uh, with national, national societies on the ground. At the same time, <clears throat> as it was mentioned early, uh, earlier, really this collective uh, outcome on protection, the fact that the realization mm -hmm. that we can only all collectively achieve this protection outcome and that it's only the sum total of our various interventions that mm -hmm can uh, contribute to, to that, uh, that uh, objective. So really, yeah, continuing working together. And it's really good to have you on board with us today. And hopefully, um, we'll continue that dialogue. And on that note, uh, I invite you to join us next month. We have another webinar with the ICRC on, uh, around the, the professional standard on protection. Mm -hmm. So a discussion, a presentation on the standards, but also a kind of a discussion around how it is used and implemented in the field. So we'll send you another invitation for that uh, next month. Thanks a lot for joining us from the field. Uh, welcome uh, to all of you, and see you next month. Thank you very much to our two panelists so for coming all the way. Bye. Thank Thanks you. Bye. 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 Thank you. Uh, bye, guys. Bye.